Hey guys, how's it going? So I just wanted to come on here real fast and um, a story has been going around in my mind today and I've been praying about doing this Dear Prophet thing um, and writing a status about it, but I didn't know exactly how to tell the story without doing um, a video. So the story is, is that I, about three years ago, when I came to South Africa, I was preaching, I was traveling with a, a, a minister, and hey, Connie, I was traveling with a minister, and we were, um, we were going uh, to different churches and things like that, and we were learning, I was learning how to flow in the prophetic here in Cape Town. Hey, Mari, hey, guys, and... So at the end of the service, he would turn the mic over to me and he would allow me to flow in words of wisdom and words of knowledge. And I was still getting used to flowing in the gifts of the spirit in South Africa. And I was amazed that the same Holy Spirit in South Africa is the same Holy Spirit in America. I know that sounds weird, but it was it was pretty amazing. Hey, Faye. Hey, Melissa. Um, and so... I, I just, I began to pray and I, I was releasing a word of knowledge and up until that point in the service, um, everything was pretty much accurate. The words were flowing. I, I had called out uh, people that had uh, back injuries and uh, stomach problems. I had prayed for the pastor's wife, which um, only the pastor and her knew the medical condition that was going on and stuff like that. And Carrie is actually folding uh, clothes right now. And so everything was, um, everything was on point. And I remember at the end of the, um, end of the session, I called up and I said, there are about three people in this service, three couples that, um, want to get pregnant. They're, they're wanting to conceive a child and they're not able to. Well, I don't know if you've ever been in a service where, it just goes dead silent, <laughs> like crickets. You can hear the pers people breathing. It was, I was so scared because up until that point, everything was working out fine. And I, I thought I was hitting the mark on everything. And I call the, call them up and I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. Why is this happening? Hey, Christina. And so, I went ahead and I was so embarrassed and I was embarrassed for the prophet that was teaching me and all that kind of stuff that I actually shut down the moving of the prophetic in that service. And I, um, you, you've seen it on my face. I, I look back at the video now. You've seen it on the, my face and I actually gave the mic back to the prophet and sat down and just, I, I was done. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. And so what happened was, is that after the service, we're uh, driving back to Cape Town. We were in outside of Parle and we were, had a 45 minute ride. And I will never forget this, what this prophet spoke to me. He told me that when you give a word of knowledge, you have to know that you know that you know that God spoke to you. And if you know that you know that you know that God spoke to you, instead of allowing the enemy to creep in like it did and cause you to doubt the gift that you're moving in and also put doubt in the service on everything else that happened, you pray and say, I know that you're in the room and that your miracle is happening right now. And you begin to carry on with the service. Now, after the service, I forgot to say, the three people actually came up to me after the service and said, I am the couple that I want, that needed prayer, that wanted to have children. And so after the service, I'm praying for three couples in the front. And so they were too scared, they were too scared because they were embarrassed. They didn't, they've never experienced the word of knowledge. In fact, one of the couples, um, was it um, this past week? Last week, just had a second child. Um, so what I'm telling you is, is that the word of knowledge, you have to know that you know that you know that you know that God um, gave you that word. And if nobody stands up, I can remember, um, I can remember many services now where I have 
said that God has called this out. Mari, Mari would be on here and Conchita would know this. Um, at uh, Faith Pleaches God, I have prophesied about um, someone that had gone through um, weight loss. No, it's not them. It's not them, y'all guys. But it was someone else. Um, they, they were trying to lose weight and nobody, nobody came up and I, they needed prayer and stuff like that. We'll come to find out later that person got completely healed and is lo- and has lost weight. So what they I'm saying, the they were in a back room yeah. and they couldn't hear what I had prophesied. They actually came to me after watching the live stream. And at the very moment that I released that prophetic word in the service, they, that word of knowledge, they felt God touched them in the back room in the children's department and God healed them. And they came and found me and began to just tell me what God's doing in their life and how God healed them. And they're losing weight drastically. And they were planning on getting a surgery and things like that. So what I'm telling you is, is don't allow doubt to creep in when you're releasing a prophetic word. Don't allow doubt to, re, to creep in when you're moving in the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are meant to establish the kingdom of God. They're meant to call those that do not believe. You can have unbelievers in the service, both saved and unsaved. And so when God gives you something, um, it's meant to actually bring them into the things of God to where they're awakened to the freedom that's found in the Holy Spirit to begin to birth the kingdom of God and be able to do those things. Uh, Jeannie, accuracy in the spirit. I can tell you the easiest way for accuracy in the spirit. And that is a couple of things. Um, the word of God, you to prophesy, to have words of knowledge, to, to, to pray, whatever it is, you have to be so in tune with the word of God. And I mean the Bible. You have to have a relationship with the Bible. And so what that means is, is that, um, Study the word, marry yourself to the word, because when you begin to prophesy, the everything that you say should be able to be found in the Bible. It should be able to line up with the word. The second thing is, is pray in the Holy Spirit. And what does it say in Jude? You build up your most holiest faith. All right. So you build up the pure reality of heaven in your life and on the earth, and you're able to prophesy with accuracy because you are full of faith. You have allowed that faith, the Holy Spirit, to build up on the inside of you. A couple of other things that help me begin to prophesy accurately is that I have a, um, I can, I have a journal dating back to all the way when I was seven years old when I started prophesying. And I'm 31 years old now. And my mom would teach me to, uh, write and say, thus says the Lord. And I would say, thus says the Lord. And I would begin to write. And out of writing, thus says the Lord, uh, God would give me things for my life or give me things for other people. And I would keep that to myself. And what I would see is, is that it would come to pass sometime or later. It was a confirmation for me. So all those things begin to go ahead and they begin to um, build up confidence and build up your faith to release a prophetic word. Now, for me to release a prophetic word, I, I don't question. I don't question if it's God or not. Now let's talk about accountability and let's talk about, um, I didn't even plan on having this on the live stream. I was just telling a really quick story, <laughs> but, uh, accountability and, um, uh, accountability and, um, being trained by the Holy Spirit. I hope that makes sense. Um, so accountability, I'm accounted to leaders. There are leaders that watch my live stream. There are people that, um, my board that watch my live stream. And so if I prophesy an error, if I say something that is contrary to the word of God, even if I'm preaching a sermon, um, they have the ability to speak into my life. So I don't just, I'm not just a fly by night prophet. I don't believe in parking lot prophecy. 
um, unless, you know, God, and unless I'm in a raw stress for less and I walk out of the parking lot and God gives me a word for somebody or in the shopping center. But parking lot prophecy, thank you, Carrie. Um, parking lot prophecy is in a service. If, if, if God is moving and there's a leadership there and you have a prophetic word for the house or you have a prophetic word for a, um, individual, you should go to the leadership of that church and you should release it in the time frame of the service. Or if you don't have it within the time frame of the service, you go to the leadership of that house and you say, look, I, I don't, I'm, I'm new here. Or I have a word for so and so. How can I deliver it to them? So, that's accountability. And even as a minister that um, preaches the gospel, I, I carry that. I do not prophesy to just anybody because I have the ability to prophesy. If I'm in a church service, I will call another leader. Even if I'm the guest minister and I'm ministering in that church service, I will have leadership around me that will hear that word, that will judge that word accordingly. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that when you release a um, prophetic word, it must always line up with the, with the Bible. I don't care what it is. It must line up with the Bible. It does not have to be, um, just a confirmation in that person's life. It can be, uh, something new. God awakening the destiny in someone's life. God putting hope in someone's life. With that said, I do not agree that you should prophesy outside of your faith. The Bible says, and, um, I can't find the scripture right now because I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I will, um, I'll post it in the um, comments. The Bible says that you should prophesy according to your faith. So if you cannot believe God, for a debt-free house, do not prophesy for a debt-free house. If you cannot believe God for a debt-free car, do not prophesy that someone's getting a debt-free car. Prophesy according to your faith. The reason why I prophesy for debt-free homes and debt-free cars that I don't pay for and medical bills being wiped away and promotions on jobs and different things like that is because that is my faith. I live in a house that I do not pay for. I drive a car. I do not pay for it. My church building, I do not pay rent on. So that is my faith. That is where I'm at. Thank you, Carrie. It's in Romans 12. And six, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, that word grace there means favor. God will give you gifts according to the favor that you need upon your life, either in that time frame, in that moment, or in the duration of your life. It comes with there's certain grace according to the office of the fivefold ministry that you follow and you operate in, I mean, that you're called to. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion or the measure of his or her faith, if service in his serving or if he who teaches in his teaching or if or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who sows with mercy, shows mercy will be cheerful. So when you prophesy, prophesy according to your faith. Don't just sit there and prophesy that you're going to be an apostle if you don't know what an apostle is. You can't, Sorry, that's one of my biggest pet peeves because the prophetic has been abused because we think we can prophesy about everything when we got these little people running around being prophetic, um, not prophetic, pathetic. All right. I'm, I'm just saying they're being pathetic and they're misrepresenting God and God doesn't like it when you misrepresent them. I'm just finishing clock with that one. And so what are we? We got accountability. Prophesy according to our faith um, and allow the Holy Spirit. How do I know when I first started out that a um, prophetic word began to bubble up? I would have a heat in my belly and it would feel like um, a heat would come upon me or, or shaking would come on my knees and stuff like that. And I knew that I was about to prophesy. That was when the 
um, anointing began to become really strong on my life. And I knew that God was leading me in a direction to shift. I wasn't nervous. It was the anointing coming upon my life. Now, with what I said at the beginning of the video, there are times, and I'll be the first one to admit with all humility, that I have missed it. I have missed the prophetic word. And in those times, yes, Jeannie, it's a fire in your belly. I, I've, it's like a heat. It's hard to explain, hey? Or I've even had it where fire shot up in my bone. But um, going back to what I was saying about um, missing it, I, I remember um, I, right before I came to South Africa, um, I was believing for some finances to be released and I was believing for some things to happen. And I had delivered a prophetic word that was in, it, it was, it was an error. I, I should not have, um, I knew in my belly that it was off when I released it, but I had too much pride at the time to, um, scale it back. Can, can I say it like that? I, I had, I, I, I just, I had too much pride. Hey, John, um, I, I just had too much pride. And right before I came to South Africa, I, um, I began to pray and the Holy Spirit reminded me of this word. And I'm a very reasonable guy. If you come to me and I'm in error, if you bring me scripture or whatever, you bring me the scripture and we will sit down and we will discuss it. I am the first to say, um, that I'm learning in this since the beginning, <laughs> whatever, I, I'm just, I'm learning. <laughs> Can I just be honest with you? And so what happened is, is that the Holy Spirit brought me back to that time where I prophesied an error and the Holy Spirit told me to go to that person and to apologize to them because they were, um, someone close to me and to apologize to them and tell them, Hey, I missed this prophetic word. I should not have, um, I, I missed it. And this is, this is what I said. This is what I shouldn't have said. And this is what I believe the word of the Lord is. And I asked them to forgive me. And as I did that, um, the person came back and said, you know what? You were 100% wrong. I went to my, my dad and I went to my mom, who's the, her spiritual covering. And we just said, well, if it's God, it's God. You're a prophet. We know um, your reputation. So um, your family will take it. But something didn't sit right with her. And so for three years, I think it was for three years, she sat with that word waiting. And she was like, every time it just brought her sorrow to her belly. And for me to come to her and to tell her that I was wrong and that I miss God broke something in her and something in my life. Within three days of doing what the Holy Spirit told me to do, I ended up, I ended up getting the plane ticket to come to South Africa, which set me on my destiny. And so the Holy Spirit will ultimately lead and guide you, like it says in uh, 1 John. He will lead and guide you in all things. And in John chapter 14 and 26, um, the, the anointing, the Holy Spirit is there to teach you and guide you. And I can remember, I hope this is helping somebody. If it is, let me know. Um, I hope, and, and there's, there were times in my life that I, that, I didn't say what the Holy Spirit told me to say. There were times in my life. I remember a time in a service that God wanted me to prophesy. And I am a man of protocol. I am a man of, um, I, I just, I don't just go up and say, like, I'm a man of protocol. And so I, it was something that my parents and my spiritual parents drilled in my life. And I was in a service and God gave me a prophetic word. And so I was like, I'm waiting for the right time and the right time's not coming. And my sister's right there um, and she's a prophet too. And um, she went and she walked up to the man of God and said, I have a prophetic word. And she prophesied everything that God had given me. And I was, I was a little upset. Can, can, I, can I be honest? I was a little upset. Why God didn't you give me, you gave it to me first kind of thing. 
And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, there comes a time where you have to be bold and you have to be radical. And there's protocol, but then there's a way to release it. And what I'm trying to say is that allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. In that moment, I realized that if I would have actually walked to the front and I would have actually had boldness and not been afraid to do what God told me to do, I could have did and released what God had given me. There were times when I had preached And the Holy Spirit has taken me through the whole service in my dream or the whole in a vision or or in my quiet time and said, this is where you've done wrong. This is where you did right. And this is where you could have said it better. And to surrender to the prophetic, to surrender to the gifts of God, to surrender to the words of knowledge and, and the words of wisdom. I don't believe that you should just give a prophetic word and that's it. I, like I had somebody say, God's bringing you stability. All right, stability, great. You've been a prophet for 40 something years. Tell me what stability means. How is God bringing me stability? You can work in the prophetic, but desire also to give words of wisdom with the prophetic. So if God, God did bring me through to stability, I'm living in stability now, but where's the wisdom behind it? Where's the knowledge behind it? And always when you're desiring to prophesy, don't just stop at the first word. Sometimes it comes as a word. Sometimes it comes as a vision. There's, there's, uh, there's visions that I've had where I've, where I just seen a girl playing with a baby doll and all, and I, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said to go up to her and say to her, God doesn't like it when you play baby dolls. I didn't understand what that meant. And when I released that prophetic word to her, when I released that sentence and that vision that I had, she was in her 20s, which was really weird for me. She ended up busting out crying because baby dolls were a code name or a name where her, her uncle would, would abuse her. And I had no idea. But it came in a vision and it came in a, um, in two words, baby dolls. And when I said baby dolls, God doesn't like it. God doesn't like it when you play baby dolls. There's been times when I'm here in South Africa, Argentina, and different places of the world where God will give me, um, my battery's about to go dead, um, where God will give me a, a, a word in their language. And I would speak that word. I remember one time I spoke a word, um, just one word. I can't even remember what the word was in Argentina and the glory of God. Hey, prophet Tiffany, the glory of God hit the whole auditorium and people began to weep and laugh and cry under the power of God. I remember I said, um, I can't remember the Afrikaans word for a God tonight, but a lady was in a a prayer line and I had sat with that word for about 24 hours. And when she came in front of me, I said that word in Afrikaans, she dropped to the ground and it was because she was believing. She said, God, if you don't show up tonight, she was believing for God to show up tonight and for an American to come 23 to 30 hours away and speak an Afrikaans word to her that God, that meant God tonight meant a miracle was going to take place. So flowing in the prophetic and doing what I'm doing, I'll give one more example and all that, um, is I've learned to wait upon the Holy Spirit. I've learned to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to develop that gift and that voice. And I know that I know that I know when he speaks to me. And it came at times, like I said earlier, when I gave that prophetic word and nobody showed up. There was a service. Thank you, Tiffany, for sharing. Please share and like this video, guys. I hope it's blessing someone. Um, There was a time in a, a, a service I was preaching. Let me just put the power cord in. I was preaching. Um... 
I was preaching and the service had shifted and I began to flow in miracles and signs and wonders. And I began to call out um, different things and nobody was showing up. And at the time I started live streaming. Well, nobody was there and I knew God was speaking to me. And this is about good 10, 20 minutes that I was calling out. <laughs> I mean, I was calling out everything, um, names, all this kind of stuff, healing, cancer, all this. Nobody was showing up to my altar call. I was like, oh my goodness, I have missed it. But I remember what I learned from that prophet that was mentoring me. And so every time I gave the prophetic word, I said, I said this, I said, I know you're in the room, be healed now. And I moved on. Finally, nobody was answering my, 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 my words of knowledge. So I was live streaming. So I said, I told everybody, so that God wants to heal cancer in this room tonight. He spoke to me specifically that he's healing cancer. So it must not be you. And now we have a good 100 people in the auditorium. It must not be you. It has to be someone else on the live stream. So I called the person holding my camera. Do you remember that, Carrie? I called the person holding my camera and I looked into the camera and I said, if you are believing God to heal you of cancer right now, lift your hands. And I begin to minister to the live stream. When I step back, I said, the same power that touched the people on the live stream is going to touch you if you run to the front now. When I did that, five people ran to the front that had all been battling with cancer or had a family member that was battling with cancer. And God began to heal people. When that started happening, people started coming. I called out eyes that were burning. We had a blind eye open up. We had a deaf ear open up. We had arms that began to grow. We had legs that began to grow. Miracles began to take place. I knew that I knew by the power of the Holy Spirit that he spoke to me and I did not back down. Moving in the prophetic is one of the highest levels of faith, catch this, that you can operate in because you're literally prophesying the supernatural into the natural. You're calling that which is not into existence. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying because you're literally taking the, the, what God did in Genesis chapter one. You're stepping into that creative power, that creative anointing, and you are literally releasing it into the atmosphere and people's lives are being shifted and changed. For me, God has been giving me strategies for countries and he's been giving me what God's going to do. I have never in, I've been, like I said before, I've been prophesying since I was seven years old. I was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit at four and I've been prophesying since I was seven years old and now I'm 31, about to be 32 years old by the grace of God. And here's the thing. I did not, I have not prophesied about nations and about Vietnam. I've never been to Vietnam. I have no desire to go to Vietnam. Uh, and God's giving me words of knowledge and words of uh, prophetic words for countries now that I am beginning to contact people in those countries or I'm releasing. And I've never done that before. There was one time for South Africa Right before we left, there was a terrorist attack that God showed me in the spirit. But I, I sent that out. Uh, Prophet Catherine is on this uh, live stream and she would know about it. I only sent it out to three or four people because I was scared. <laughs> I was literally scared because in the dream and in, in the dream, I seen the terrorist attack happening. It was maybe four months later. I was in the States and the CIA and uh, the UK issued um, one of those warnings that they can't come, don't come to South Africa because, or be careful because there's supposed to be a terrorist attack. I've never done that before, but God has, and that was two years ago, God has taken me on a journey of being led by the Holy Spirit. And it started that no matter what it looks like, no matter what it looks like, I know that I know that I know that I heard from God. 
And it's such a privilege and an honor to be able to say, thus says the Lord. And I don't take it lightly. When I release a prophetic word, I realize that I am accountable for that word. I realize there was a time that I was shopping and I released a prophetic word over some people that um, I said, you're going to conceive a child and you're, in fact, you're pregnant and you don't even realize it yet. I was so, I, 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 it was, it was just something, it just happened in the service. And I was, um, in fact, Prophet Catherine, I was talking to you at the time and I hung up the phone and I said I had to pray. I was in the middle of a shopping center and I began to pray for, um, for that couple. Little did I know they were actually, and I began to do warfare. Little did I know that they were actually in the doctor's office trying to find out if she was pregnant or if she had a disease or something in her organs. She gets in that moment, I'm interceding. She doesn't have a disease. Nothing's wrong with her, but she's pregnant with her first child. I will never, ever forget that moment because it made me realize how accountable I am to the words that proceed out of my mouth. Moses realized that when he was named the deliverer at the, and, and he was told at the burning bush, you speak what I say, Moses, and you will deliver my people. And Moses said, I'm a stutterer. I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, it's not possible for me to do this. And he raised up Aaron to do it. And, and from that moment forth, I realized that a prophetic word, when I release it, I'm accountable to it because at any time, People don't know. There are times that I have released a prophetic word. There's a, it's hard to explain because there is a weight that you carry. When I, when I release the vision about the big fish that I gave today, I don't take that lightly. I don't take, I don't take that lightly. We are, we are so accountable for what we say. Hey, Mike and Carrie. Hey, Megan. That's right, Megan. I don't take that lightly because I realize that the prophetic or the vision that I gave today about the whale, people are believing in that. That's their hope. And hope deferred makes a heart sick. Now, ultimately, I am not God and I am not going to try to be God, but I have I have a, a, an anointing. I have a voice that will allow me to intercede. For that particular person that's believing for that prophetic word to come to pass. It's something that I don't take lightly. Second thing about prophetic words, when it comes to you, it can either be a blessing or a judgment to you. Okay? So let me, let me, let me, um, bring some clarity to that real fast. When you get a prophetic word, either you can choose to believe in that prophetic word, no matter how crazy or far-fetched that that is, or you can, and you can let it become a blessing to you. You can honor that word. And by honoring that word, you honor the prophet and you receive a prophetic, re, a prophet's reward. All right. So when you, when you, when you sit there and you just disregard that prophetic word, oh, that's not God. That man's crazy and stuff. You're talking a against the prophet of God or against the voice of God. Even if they are the most craziest person in the world. I look, I have had. My share, I, I will never forget something last year. God, God spoke to me to go bring seven, um, I make pasta sauce and I freeze it and I take it out. I bring seven freezer bags of, um, pasta sauce and, um, pasta noodles and bread to a homeless person on the side of the road selling flowers. That is the most craziest Thing that I have ever heard God tell me do one of them and so I go and I walk over to down the road I didn't have a car at the time and I give this to this homeless person selling flowers this homeless person selling flowers prophesied to me my vision for my church and did not even know me and then added on to what God had said to the car that I am driving today. 
Now, I could have sat there and looked at a homeless person that they're crazy, all right? And I'm, I'm the prophet. I'm supposed to minister to them. But being a prophet means that I, I walk, how can I put it? I walk in a level of humility that I can't explain because God will not let me do certain things. That is why prophets walk a lonely path. That is why prophets walk a, 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 a path of rejection and things like that. Not because, uh, well, for two things, the enemy is trying to silence your voice. So when you're lonely and stuff like that as a prophet, if, if we must be humble, yes. But remember, your humility can be pride to someone else. So never, ever compare yourself to someone else. Never, ever, ever do that. But when you're lonely, when you're facing rejection, the enemy is trying to do one or two things. They're trying to silence your voice and derail you from manifesting heaven on earth. But also the second thing that comes with that is that it's time for you to get into the secret place. It's t- intimacy with God. It, it doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter how much loneliness it is. Hey, brother Andy, you have to sit there and go to the secret place because in the secret place, that is where the accuracy of God is. I only prophesy because of the, of the relationship that I have with God. I do not, if you, if you don't have nothing to say, don't say it. You're just, you're just wasting air. Just don't say it. Only speak what God tells you. When people come up to me and ask me for a prophetic word, I hand them the Bible and I tell them, here's the Bible. There's 66 books, Genesis to Revelation. Go find yourself a word. Because I realize the weight, the weight that is on me when I release that prophetic word. I I would not, when I ordain people as prophets, when I tell people that they're a prophet, I do not do it lightly because I realize that to be called a prophet, you're marked to create miracles because when you release the word of God, you're creating a miracle. You're creating, you're speaking someone's destiny. Your very word can either bring life or death to somebody. I remember when people and, and accountability, when you prophesy, I always, I always record the prophetic word that I give people. It doesn't matter if I pull out my phone. It doesn't matter if I, I carry a recorder, a digital recorder it with me in my bag when I minister. Because I've had people, I had one, by, one guy say that his mom's dying and that he's sinning and he's going to hell and all that kind of stuff. I literally took the prophetic, the, the recorder out, played the prophetic word on the phone after I found out about it. Hello, Anthony. God's going to heal your back. Don't worry about it. And I played that prophetic word um, for that person. And when they heard the prophetic word, they said, bro, you, you didn't even say that. They were ready to, they were, they, they, said they spent like 24 hours sitting there telling everybody that I was a false prophet until it got to me. I don't allow the enemy That's another thing. Every word that rises up against me, I will put to shame. The weapon might form. I'm talking about in Isaiah. Why will I put it to shame? Why will I condemn those words? And this is for every Christian, every Christian out there. Because I've, I've taken a place of humility. I've taken a place to walk in a place of humbleness. I've taken a place to sit there and allow God to speak through me and to allow God to, to just be God because I just want God. I don't, I don't care about the stages. I don't care about the, the views on the live stream. I don't care anything about that. I just want God. And to, this all started off with accuracy and words of knowledge and things like that. Because at the end of the day, it's not about how many churches I planted. It's not about how many healings. It's not about the stages that I've been on. 
that's that's nothing. I, in fact, for me to talk for however long I've been talking about my experience and stuff like that, um, it's it's difficult for me because I don't want to boast. I don't want anybody to think that I'm somebody or something like that because I'm 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 just a donkey. I'm just someone for God to use. And when you come to a place where you just want God, when you come to a place where it doesn't matter the word, I've I've had to give hard words. I've had to I've had to stand up in churches churches and say because of sin and because of Ichabod, uh, because of what you've done, Ichabod has hit this house. Ichabod has hit this house. I remember, and with tears in my eyes, it was the first ministry meeting that Carrie and I was on. I sat in a large church in Joburg, and I looked at the pastor, and I told him, grace and mercy will only get you so far because of what you're doing behind closed doors with members of your church. And you do not want me to preach in this place because if I do, the judgment of God will come. I had tears in my eyes when I said that because ultimately, and I want you to catch this, and this is why, um, this is why when I give a word of knowledge, I don't, I don't let doubt come into the service because there's that young prophet, there's that young preacher there's that person that's crying out for a real God. And there's someone that's believing for their miracle. And my, my purpose in that moment as a minister of the gospel, as a flaming fire for God, is to be a representation to the best of my ability of God so they can come in contact. My job is to meet them at their faith level. If a minister cannot go down to the simplest and make the gospel simple, then they need to really go back to the secret place and learn how to connect with God and their people. You can, look, I carry a PhD. I have a a doctorate in, in, in divinity. But if I can't make it plain, if I can't make the gospel practical, I have no business in being a behind a pul- pulpit, behind a phone doing a live stream, or holding a mic, whatever it is. Because my God is real. My God was real to me when I had cancer. My God was real to me when I was drunk and I didn't know how to get home. My God was real to me when nobody else was there and I was ready to kill myself. And so if my God can be real to me, and I love my God that much, then I love his people that much, and I want them to have such an encounter that I guard the atmosphere, and I guard what I say. I, I watch what I say. God can reveal to me the deepest sin in someone's life and the, the most horrific things. I've seen the most horrific things in pictures that, that can be imagined in intercession and different things like that. But I've came to a place where half the time nobody even knows it. I've learned, I, I pray and I say this almost every day. Father God, grace me to have the grace and elegance to operate in the office of a prophet. Give me the grace and eloquence to speak your word. Because at the end of the day, I'm representing God. And that's something that we need to realize, not just as a prophet, not just as someone prophesying, but in every aspect of our Christian walk. You could be the only Jesus that someone comes in contact with. And you should guard the atmosphere around you, especially when it comes to the prophetic. Especially because... God is raising up a prophetic people in this hour. God is raising up an apostolic people in this hour.
Praise God, Jenny. Jenny, I just want to believe God for accuracy in your life and that the gifts of the Holy Spirit will stir up on you like never before. And so when I move in the prophetic, when I begin to move in the prophetic, I realize how important that is. And I realize that for better or worse, what I am saying affects somebody's life. So when, you de- when Paul says, I desire that you pray in the spirit, when I desire that you pray and you prophesy, he's desiring that you go deeper into intimacy with God. That's my personal take on it. He's desiring that you love God more than anything in the world. Because out of that love, the secret things of God, God is it. The Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. There's been times when I have prophesied to pastors and I've turned my mic off and I prophesied to them and they winked because of what I had to tell them. I prophesied to a regional director here in Cape Town. I I told them I can't deliver this word. I have to do it in private. Because if I would have told them the word in public, in the church, they, because God was moving them and they, he was putting them over a new region and a different church and things like that. And nobody knew about it. But if I would have set it out, it would have started a church split. Do you, do you understand? Someone say, I understand the weight when you begin to prophesy. I will never, ever tell somebody God is moving you to another church because the minute that I do that, I begin to cause jealousy between the pastor and that leader or the pastor and that church member or as, as a, as an itinerary minister, when I was an itinerary minister, my effectiveness getting invited back for an encounter with God, that'll close the door. So God has taught me to say things like God is shifting the umbrella over your life and he's changing the field that you're grazing in at the moment. Now, I'm not saying you're leaving the church when I'm, I'm God's giving me the grace to be able to speak differently. Does that make sense to be able to even though God showed me hey, they're moving, they're leaving the church. But I didn't say they're leaving the church. They're, 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 that God is changing the umbrella. God is changing the field. And there's a new anointing that will begin to be poured out into your life. So when you, when you see that, when there's a sin issue in someone's life, whether it's pornography or lust, I'm not going to sit there over an open mic in an auditorium and tell somebody that you are sinning, you're sleeping with the next door neighbor or something like that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use grace and I'm going to say God is about to touch sin issues in your life. I mean, God is not, I'm not going to say sin issues. God's going to touch issues in your life and begin to bring you freedom in areas. And if God keeps on with me in my spirit to, 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 tap into certain issues specifically, and I know it'll bring shame or guilt to or affect that relationship in that house, I, I will turn off the mic and I will speak. And if I'm the guest speaker, our guest speaker, I will call the minister of the house, the pastor, the apostle of the house. And if it's in my church, I normally will call my, my wife to judge that word as long as, and we're also recording it because I realize the effect that my words have. And there are people that are on this live stream that know me. Hey, I have messed up. I, I am not the, the, what, what you're saying, what you're hearing me say has came from trial and error. And I, last year, I, I prophesied and I said something and I didn't catch what I said when I said it. And I had to go back to not just that apostle. And good friend of mine and apologize, but also to the person that I spoke to and apologize and, and to walk in the prophetic and accuracy of the prophetic and to release a prophetic word. You have to be willing to say, hey, I, I messed up to be teach, teachable. 
that's, I don't know who this is, but yes, you must, but God will not embarrass a church. God will not embarrass a people. God does everything in love because love covers a multitude of sin. And so when you prophesy, desire that you shall love above everything. Desire that you are, are oozing and seeing with eyes of love. And as you flow in love as a prophet, there's times that I have, I, I have, I have told people, I said, I, I've called them out and I said, look, you're playing with God. You need to get, get right, get to walking with God or God's going to sing you through a season. But I, it was, it was done in love because what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Okay. And also what you sow, you will reap. Would you like somebody to sit there and tell in front of a hundred to a thousand people, 10,000 people? And this is how I prophesy. I've prophesied to 10,000 people before uh, in a service with 10,000 people. Would you like somebody to tell you you, in front of 10,000 people you're dealing with pornography and that you need to ship up and shape out? I don't think so. Hey, Pastor Veronica, I don't think so. Allow God to develop the giftings on the inside of you and the accuracy of the spirit on the inside of you to flow in love. Because ultimately your gifting is meant to be for the edification of the saints. Um, Baby, can you get me my iPad? I just I want to break something down real fast for you. Out of my prophetic manual. I hope this is good, guys. I, I, I am, I, I'm going to have to retitle, caption this <laughs> uh, video. Um, let me see. I'm going to uh, Adobe. Acrobat. Thank you, Jesus. So, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, it says this, but one who prophesies speaks to men in edification and exhortation and consolation. Edification, this is what the word edification means in the Greek there. It means architecture, the art of building, framing, and structuring. So when you prophesy, you should give an architecture uh, and build up, frame up, and structure in somebody in somebody's life. You should not just sit there and just just prophesy because you feel like prophesying. It should have a purpose. Edification means structure, the act of building, the method of building an organization. Edification means confirmation, establishing, fixing, setting, or making certain gives new strength or assurance, additional evidence, proof convincing and testimony so when you prophesy and you're bringing edification it should bring strength it should give new strength it should uh be giving uh uh, making something certain it should bring assurance to somebody's life it should bring additional evidence it should excuse me bring proof and convincing testimony and testimony means breaking of silence Building, framing, erecting, and laying a foundation. So when you prophesy, you should frame, you should erect, you should lay a foundation, edifying, building up the Christian knowledge, instructing, and improving the mind. So it should bring a Christian knowledge. That means when you prophesy, you should be able to point in scripture if somebody asks you where it's at. And if you cannot do it in the moment, you should ask, you should tell them, let me get back to you on that. And at the end of the service or later through an email or whatever, be able to give them the scripture for it instructing and improving the mind because the mind where the word is it enlightens the mind it awakens the mind the entry of his word brings light the word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path exhortation means to call near 
And that word call near means to cause people to desire his presence more. So when you prophesy to somebody, you're exhorting them. You're, you're calling them into the secret places of God. You're calling them into a deeper walk with God. Earnest supplication, humble and earnest prayer. It should bring them to a place of humility, a place of humbling themselves and a place of prayer with God. Consolation, comfort. And I love the meaning of consolation here um, from the Webster's Dictionary. I'm using um, a, a version from the 18th century. Comfort, alleviation of misery or distress of the mind refreshment of the mind or spirit supports and strengthens the mind as in giving hope, joy, and courage. Hey, hope. (laughs) I ended it with hope and I said hope. (laughs) And so when you prophesy and you exhort somebody and you deliver the prophetic word, it should alleviate misery. When people come from your prophetic word and they're distressed or they're confused or they just don't understand, you actually open up a door for witchcraft to come into their life. And as a leader and as a prophet, you should have enough integrity and character to actually sit down and tell them why God's saying this and bring light to the situation. That's why I tell people, if I prophesy to you and you do not agree with it, contact me and let's sit down and find out exactly what's going on. Why, why did it bring? Because ultimately I operated in witchcraft and that's not my heart. Or Jezebel stepped in and took that word from you. So it alleviates misery. Uh, Well, I'm not saying that I operated in it, but you're accusing me of operating in it. Anyway, alleviating our our misery, our distress of mind, refreshment of mind, our spirit supports and strengthens the mind as in giving hope, joy, and courage. Entreat. That word exhortation means entreat. Urgent prayer, urgent petition, pressing, intercessory prayer. So it brings you to a place, prophetic words to bring you to a place of prayer because ultimately you are responsible for making war over that word. There are prophetic words that I have in my life that I make war over every single day and um, words that I even got this past week that I make war over. Uh, dealing with a situation in my life that um, a prophet told me this week, I'm making war to see that thing come to pass. Because if I really believe God is speaking, if it's really the prophetic word, if it's really the voice of God coming through that person, then the enemy is going to do everything in its power to stop it from manifesting. All right? So it says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 3, edification, exhortation, and consolation. Consolation means um, this. It means to comfort, to bring support and consolation when under calamity, distress, or danger. So if you are in a dangerous place, if you are in a place where you need help or something like that and the prophetic comes, it should bring you freedom. It should not bring you calamity. It should not bring you distress. It should not bring you danger. All right. And then. Excuse me one second. All right. And then consolation and console to give rest peace or strength to cheer the mind and the distress of depression and alleviate grief. (laughs) That's a lot there. All right. Let me say it. Console. So consolation, the Greek word, you take it down and it means console. To give rest, peace, strength, to cheer the mind and distress or depression and to alleviate grief. So when the prophetic word comes, imagine when um, Moses sat sat there in Exodus chapter 15 and he says this, keep silent, the Lord will fight your battles. Imagine the, the, the peace and the rest that it brought. Imagine that. So when we prophesy, that's what we should be doing. Encourage to give or increase confidence of success to inspire with courage 
spirit, our strength of mind to hold, to make bold. So when you begin to prophesy, you should, you should sit there and you should build them up. You, they should walk away with so much confidence in their lives that they can take on the enemy that's coming at them because that's what the word of God does. You never see the word of God beat somebody up. You never see the word of God tell somebody it's going to end. It's not going to happen. Their life's going to be destroyed. No, when, when in the Bible, it means life. And so God is going to give you life words, life words to speak. Hey, Thank you, Shauna, for sharing. Please share and like this video. I hope it's helping someone. So when it, when you prophesy, when you prophesy, it should be the edification, the exhortation, and the consolation. So when I prophesy, those are the things that I use as a guideline. Those are the things that I use to go ahead and, and, and guide me prophesying. Even when I prophesied and spoke that God's presence was leaving a house or a church and Ichabod had hit that house or that God was going to do something or something like that, I always, always, always did it in love and tried to build them up. Or show them how and why they got to where they're at. Thank you, Mar Mariah, for thank you for sharing. I just want to cover one more thing since you know I got this um, prophetic manual out. The hindrances to the operation of the gifts. Is this helping somebody out there? If it is, let me know. Um, if you have any questions, since I'm on right now, I'll go ahead and answer them. But fear hinders the operations of the gifts. Romans 8.15 says this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoptions of sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. So when you, re when you begin to prophesy, when you begin to release the word of God, you should realize that you're coming from a place of authority, that you're coming from a place seated in heavenly places. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love. So if you're operating in love and you love God's people and you love God more than anything, there's no fear. There should be no fear when you're when you're operating. But perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves improvement. Uh, fear, fear involves punishment. Sorry. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. That's first John 418. Now, let me go ahead and say something when I. When I am teaching a prophetic word, a prophetic class, or even in my church, when I, when someone prophesies, I do not openly correct them. I, I do it in private. If they go ahead and they deliver a prophetic word, and I know that I know that I know that it's not God, I go ahead in the best of my ability in love not to bring shame to them, not to bring dishonor to them, not to embarrass them because I ultimately want them to move in the gifts of the spirit. I ultimately want them to move into the things of God and walk out the calling and the purpose of God upon their life. And so I do everything in love and I've tried to bring correction in love, whether done in private or not. I remember... We had, unless it's really bad. Now, if you, if you, if you gone cocoa with some cocoa puffs, I think we're going to, we're going to have a conversation. Okay. But it should be at most, most done in love. I mean, if you're prophesying really crazy, I'm just going to shut you down right there and tell you, um, but I'm going to do it in love. All right. Now, with that being said, I'll give you an example. Um, we had um, a, a well-known speaker come to Cape Town and the kids in our church got activated and praying for people on the street. And they had a, a, a specific way that they were taught how to um, do street evangelism. And that was to walk up and ask people, do you have pain in your body or, or if you are something like that? And I, I was with them and I wasn't really... 
Um, I was just there to make sure that they didn't get in trouble, that they didn't get run over by bus. I, I was purposely not going to prophesy to anybody. <laughs> uh, and so what happens is, is that I noticed when they began to approach people that they were not hitting the mark. Now, one of the first apostolic um, ministries that I started and when God was teaching me to be apostolic was street evangelism. And that's where I really, um, besides in my parents' church and when they ministered, um, I cut my teeth, so to speak, in prophetic ministry and releasing a prophetic word. And so I went ahead and I, um, a prophet once, let me see this. A prophet once told me a family member was going to die soon. I was shocked and didn't accept the word. Well, Tara, um, let me let me just clarify something like that. I I have prophesied that a family member would go home or something like that before, but they were it it was a unique situation. It was a very hard word. I. I didn't prophesy death. I and I did not give a time frame. I did not say anything. My word was this. I said, uh, when this per, that when when this family member leaves your family, it will be the start of a new ministry birthing in your in your family's life, and you will see um, a new time period of the ministry within your life and within your family ministry life's coming because there was an anointing being passed down. So, um, I don't know how that person prophesied to you, but I have done it and it wasn't the, the nicest, it wasn't a word because I love the person. It still, <laughs> it still brought edification. It still brought life. It still brought, it followed the matrix. If you would say that I spoke about earlier, but what I was saying was they were, they were scaring the people as they were coming um, to approach them to for street evangelism. And I ended up, because I, I cut my teeth in street evangelism, and like I said before, and so I walked up to the next person and I said this, I, I, um, I said, let me, let me show you how I used to do things and let me um, teach you, let me, let me just show you and maybe I can teach you something. And they were more than willing, they were open to it. And I said to them, how can I pray for you? I didn't, I didn't prophesy to them. I didn't say, do you have pain in your body? I didn't do anything like that. I said, how can I pray for you? And by opening up that door and allow the prophetic, we began to see more miracles happening. In fact, we went into a KFC with that. How can I pray for you? And that, um, that completely, but I did it in love. I didn't walk up to that to those people that had just spent a week in a, an evangelistic class and said, you missed the mark, you messed up, you didn't get it right, and this is how we should do it. Because ultimately, we have a certain, we so show Jesus in different ways. And we can all be sharpened, we can all learn a different way to do things. But fear, I was talking about the hindrances, hindrances of the gifts. Second Timothy 1, 7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, timidity, but of love, power, and discipline. Discipline. Fear will cripple you and stop you from operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Fear, fear's goal is to silence your voice on the earth so that heaven is not released. Get that. When you operate in fear, when you say something, um, when you literally prophesy, whether you're prophesying over someone's life, over a church, over a region, even over your own life, or you're just declaring the words of God, you are destroying the enemy. You are destroying the, I can't just say it any other way. You're establishing the kingdom of God when you begin to prophesy. Hey, Trudy. And so fear Fear's goal is to keep the sons and daughters of God in bondage and never living out the divine destiny. Think about that. If you're a prophetic people, the spirit of prophecy is working in you. You are a walking prediction of God on the earth. And you're afraid of speaking the word of God. You're afraid of moving out in faith and miracles and knowledge and things like that. 
I remember I was in a old mutual. I was in an old mutual building. Um, old mutual preaching their lunch session in a corporate setting. And I said, there's a guy named David that was in a car accident and that God wants to heal him. Um, and, and set him free, and the doctors are going to be amazed. And I said that, and nobody in there knew David. They thought I was crazy. I get an email. It's one of those crazy things again. So we pray for David in the service. I get a phone call at the end. Uh, not at the end. I get an email at the end of the day. A guy named David was supposed to go be at work that day, but on the way to church, got into a car accident and God healed him miraculously and the doctors were amazed. But what if I was afraid of walking out my prophetic destiny, my destiny of being a prophet, my destiny of releasing the words of God? Some of the greatest um, challenges that I faced has came from family and different things like this. Where they said that I, where, where I was afraid what my family would think. But common fears of fear, fear of failure. How can you prophesy about some, somebody's destiny if you're afraid to fail? There is no failure in God. The Holy Spirit comes to move you forward. Comes to move you forward. Um, babe, I can't read the comments. Uh, but Michael asked a question. Um, I had a dream Saturday afternoon. I seen the word loose and then I seen my daughters in one particular. Okay, Michael, can you do me a favor? Can you, um, can you go ahead? Can you private message me, um, your question and I will go ahead and answer it. Um, because it's not on topic right now with what I'm talking about. Um, let me see. What do you do when you share something in love and ask them if, what you shared is right or wrong and they tell you it's right but then after the word they start ignoring you how do you handle it did i miss it <laughs> hope uh i love i will answer hope's question thank you conchita for pointing it out to me baby can i have my coat please um so hope that's the walk that's the walk of being a prophet that is the walk of rejection and the enemy will cause you because the way that I feel like you're um you're 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 questioning did I miss God did God not speak to me was my word not accurate that is the enemy trying to silence your voice even if they said it's wrong she should know she heard from God yes don't look for confirmation in man fear fear of failure all right Fear of men, that goes to another thing, and I'm going to get to intimidation here in a minute. But when somebody, prophet, when, when you prophesy, look, I've had people tell me that I have, I'm cocoa for cocoa puffs, I ate the nut and the candy bar. But I've learned that I just have to stay with it. Yes, sometimes, like I've said before, but you shouldn't, when rejection comes like that, just shake, just your feet, shake, uh, Dust your shoulders off and keep on walking. Fear of mistakes, fear of satanic influence, and fear of the future, fear of poverty. So when you prophesy, if you're prophesying in love, then there should be no fear. Because you know that God called you to do this thing. There's no Intimidation. Intimidation, an act of continual harassment until the person, person's walls of resistance is broken and rejected. What he or she has or what he or she is and rejects the operation of the gift. Thank you, Michael, for um, messaging me. I got your message. So what happens is, is that the enemy will send intimidation tactics. That says you missed it. Well, she's no longer your friend. So then that must mean that, that, that I missed it or I, they don't love me or that. It doesn't, it doesn't, for me, being a prophet, 
it doesn't matter to me if they miss it or if they're not my friend after I give it to them or not. I am ultimately responsible for what God told me to do in that moment. And that is the biggest thing you have to realize. Catch it. When you prophesy, it's between you and God and you're shifting the atmosphere. And you're shifting the destiny over someone's life. And so what happens is, is that if you're afraid, all right, if you're afraid that you missed it or something, you can't do that. And the enemy, specifically with this, and they will come in and they will try and try and try and say that you messed it, you missed it, you missed it, you missed it. But that's when you rise up with Hebrews 13 and 6 that says, So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So even if man says you missed it, even if they said you ate the nut and the candy bar, and so what if you did? It's between you and God ultimately. And if you have a fear and a reverence for God and you love God more and you are after the heart of God and you've done it in love, remember love covers a multitude of sins. Psalms 56 and 4, in God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Psalms 118 and 6. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can men do to me? So it doesn't matter what people say, if you missed it or not. Ultimately, when the enemy comes with rejection, and words like you missed it and things like that is to hinder the prophetic gifting upon your life. You want to know one of the biggest things that I, one of the biggest things that I had a problem with prophesying about was prophesying about finances and about miracle finances and things like that. And I had a problem with it, not because I didn't, I, 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 I didn't, I had a problem with it because I was afraid of what people would say about me. Well, I'm just that prophet, prophetic, prosperity preacher. I'm just that person and all that kind of stuff. But I ultimately realized that I had a fear of poverty. I had a fear of being in poverty. I had a fear of, of, it's hard to explain. I just, I, I never, I, I didn't do altar offering. I always shied away from doing the offerings. I always shied away because I was afraid of what God, I was afraid. I just, I can't explain it. I was afraid and I was afraid of what man was going to say. Because if you tell someone that God's going to give them a house or if you tell someone God's going to give them a thousand dollars or something like that, uh, and they don't do it, who are they going to come for? Who are they going to speak against? But then I realized, hey, if it's God speaking through me, and I'm a representation of God, and all I want is God, and I love God more, and it builds people up, it exhorts people, and stuff like that, and I have the faith for it, I have to. I have to do it. Because ultimately, the words that I speak brings life. It brings freedom to people. A hindrance of the gifts is a lack of faith. Hebrews eleven six says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek them. Hey, Cindy, love you. When you begin to operate in the gifts of God, when you, begin, when you begin to operate in the gifts of God, you're operating in faith. You're stepping into the creative power that God used to create this world. You're stepping into something that has not been seen. It says in, I'm going to go to Hebrews 11, and I believe it's verse 3. Let me just find it here. 
Hebrews 11 verse 3. I hope this is helping somebody. Hebrews 11 verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. That is talking about the prophetic. That is talking about how God stepped into the prophetic. And that word world there means properly aged. It means a time period. And so when it means someone's destiny or ultimately. So when God prophesied, when God said, let there be light, he wasn't just saying, let there be a sun and a moon, because that he was talking about, let somebody's breakthrough come. So when you begin to prophesy, you're calling the invisible into the visible. You're stepping into that creative power of God. Faith is a believing not in yourself, but in God's ability through you. Unless I have that unction, like we talk about um, now, now when I prophesy, I just know, I, I, I just know I can't explain it. There are certain times that the anointing is stronger for me. I will feel the anointing like a breastplate. Um, it'll, it'll go down on my, um, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but on my chest and it'll feel like a, um, a belt around my waist. And I know the anointing's there. Sometimes it's just a word that'll come, a vision that'll come, and I'll begin to prophesy. Faith is confidence in God's word that you've studied. Once again, if you study the word of God, you will have the confidence, excuse me, to prophesy. A hindrance to the gifts of God is doubt and unbelief. James 1 and 6 says this, but he must ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. When you doubt the word, it will make you unstable. Don't doubt what God is giving you now. Um, in as I am um, talking about this. Hey, Kimberly, you, you, I would like to have someone like you prophesy over me. I am really enjoying your message. Kim, um, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to prophesy over people today. But Father God, I just ask right now that uh, for Kimberly, uh, for Kim and everybody uh, listening, that Father God, you, be, you give them a vision, you give them a sign, you give a word to them in the secret place that is so accurate, Father God, that you become so real to them, that Father God, that your, your word, Father God, becomes a lamp into their feet, that Lord God, you give them strategy, you do give them divine purpose, that Lord God, that you, you even send a prophet along their path, path, Father God, that will prophesy to them accurately and in the spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And that, Father God, that as I'm speaking right now, that you will give them a word uh, to what I'm saying right now in this moment. Now, the reason I was going someplace with this, I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk about what happens when a prophetic word is released. I love the book of Hebrews. Um, the book of Hebrews is my favorite Favorite, favorite, favorite book of the Bible besides Psalms. And then I think I go to Ephesians. And then I'll get to Acts eventually. No, Isaiah. I think Isaiah might trump Psalms, guys. Anyway, I love, I love Hebrews. Hebrews is my favorite. When I, when, look, when I doubt God, when, when I've doubted God, when I need faith, built up, I go to the book of Hebrews and it does something for me. All right, so let's let's clarify angels real fast. This is my personal belief of angels and if you disagree with it, message me and give me scriptures. Angels, and this is, is going to tie into the prophetic word, just give me a moment. Angels do not have a personality. Angels do not have a free will. 
Angels just cannot wake up one moment and decide that they're going to go over to Connie's uh, house and do whatever they want to do at Connie's house and then come over to Mike and Carrie's house in South Africa and then they'll fly back over to um, Tiffany's house. Angels do not have a free will like that. Angels are, are assigned to you and assigned to certain regions, assigned to certain people, um, and, it, and, and they're there for the ministering of the gospel. Hebrews 1 and 14, your Bible says this. And, um, well, Hebrews 1 and 13 says this. But in, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstools for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit Salvation. Okay, so angels are there to minister to serve your salvation. So your salvation, which I will teach about on another video, but salvation has specific things to it and it's tied to the Bible. And so if, like I explained yesterday on, at, at my church, salvation is like a buffet you can have deliverance, you can have the anointing, you can have the Holy Spirit, you can have this, that, and the other, but it's up to you to pick up deliverance, it's up to you to pick up the Holy Spirit, it's up to you to pick up the gift of knowledge. God has given it to you, God has said you can have it, but that's part of working out your salvation. Where the angels come in at, in my personal opinion, is when you decide to walk in freedom in that area, they are there to minister that aspect of the salvation that you believe God to minister. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Someone say you hear me. <laughs> Carrie says she hears me. I think the whole, everybody hears me. So that should, that should clarify a couple of things for people that believe in angels. Angels are not there to just show up and, and tickle your feet. They are there to actually do a job and that job is to obey the word of God and to make sure that the word of God is executed. That is why God can say in Isaiah that he sends his word and his word must produce what it was sent to produce. So, so we don't pray to angels. We don't worship angels. We don't do anything like that. And while we're on this subject, we don't worship the Holy Spirit. We worship God. Through Jesus. I'm just throwing that one out there too. So angels are there to minister our salvation. Our salvation is what we believe and what we take in the Bible. If you believe in healing, angels are there to minister healing to you. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. For this reason, we're talking, and, and I want to bring this out because people are like, how does the prophetic word actually manifest in one's life. It's found here in Hebrews chapter 2. I love it. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Back then, there was a lot of philosophy. There was a lot of things going on. And so people were sitting there and they were saying a whole bunch of things, people prophesying and everything like that. That's why if the word if you get a prophetic word that does not line up with the word of God, you should actually sit. And this is where I, I, if it does not line up with the word of God, it does not edify. It does not bring confrontation. I mean, consolation. It doesn't bring um, edification. It doesn't line up with the word. You cannot find it in the word of God. Then. That is what he's saying, right? What God is saying right here in Hebrews chapter two, verse one. Pay close attention so that you do not drift away from it. Those type of words you cast down and you send them back to the pits of hell where they came from, because those are negative words meant to destroy your destiny and the prophetic anointing and just bring havoc to the kingdom of God. Those prophetic words are actually witchcraft or word, sp word curses spoken. I had someone that prophesied to someone um, in a service 
I wasn't I, I wasn't the set man of the house and I was just I was just there visiting and they pull out that God is giving this person the sword of Maccabees. Please find me in Genesis to Revelation where the sword of Maccabees is. It's not found. It's in the Catholic Bible. God is not going to give you a sword in the Catholic Bible to be able to destroy your enemies. He's going to give you the word of God that's going to proceed out of your mouth like a hammer, like it says in Jeremiah, and cast down your enemies and destroy it. And so pay close attention to the words that are coming into your mouth, uh, that are coming in, that are being spoken through someone's mouth so that you don't drift away. Hebrews 2 verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels prove unadulterable and every transgression, disobedience received and just penalty, verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So they're talking about angels here, but that word angels there are not, it's, 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 it's twofold. It's angels that were from the Bible sent from God in the Bible, but it's also talking about messengers of God or the prophets of God. How can we neglect a great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard it. Now, how do we know of those who heard it? That is where it talks about and later in Hebrews about the great cloud of witnesses, the people that were in the word, the room and stuff like that. So when when a word is spoken through the prophets or through the word of God or declared or something like that through our messenger of God, it is confirmed to those who spoke it. And it first came through the Lord. Then verse two, Hebrews two, verse Verse four, sorry, God also testifying with them both in signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. What is that? How do I miss the part? How do you know if it's God, if it's prophetic? In fact, I'm not sure lately if it's me, God, or the enemy speaking to my mind. Okay, um, um, I'll answer that real quick after I, I answer this. And so verse 2, I mean verse 4 where it says that God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Okay, so when the prophetic word comes... It comes through the Lord. It is confirmed by us, by us. It is confirmed to us by those who heard it. So how is it confirmed by those who heard it? It lines up with the word of God. It brings edification, justification. It brings edification, exhortation, and consolation. It lines up with the word of God. The enemy is not going to tell you to go jump off a bridge. I mean, God is not going to tell you to jump off a bridge. It's going to be the Holy, it's going to be the enemy, not the Holy Spirit. So God, when the prophetic word comes into your life, God is testifying. God is demonstrating. God is taking and making a witness of it. He's breaking the silence on your behalf with both signs and wonders and various miracles. So when the prophetic word comes and you confirm it, you bear witness with it. You say, I'm going to run with this thing. I'm going to make this thing happen. It's going to be um, God in this thing. Then God says, I'm going to show up with signs, wonders and miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will. Baby, can you do me a favor? You have the prophetic manual. Can you... Um, copy and paste the part about the prophetic word, the edification constellation thing. Okay. Um, okay. And so I want you to catch that part here where it says gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Number one, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts means branding. When God gives you a gift, He's marking you. He's branding you in that thing. 
Second thing is, if you have the gift of prophecy, that means you have the ability to prophesy over yourself. If you have the gift of miracles, you have the gift of miracles to, to, to work over in your life. So that means that sometimes it's as simple as making, some people can't cook. And so cooking is a miracle for some people. Does that make sense? So as much as you're able to flow in wisdom and knowledge and miracles and all that, you should be in healing. It should be evident also in your life. There should be fruit. And so by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will, he will make the prophetic word happen. So when the prophetic word comes, it comes through the Lord. It is confirmed by those who hear it. First Corinthians verse 14 and 14, it says that let a prophetic word be um, judged. The spirit of the prophet is judged is subject to the prophet. And when those things take, take place, then God says, I am going to testify with both signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will. What is his will as I bring this to a close? His will is his word. God will not deviate from Genesis to Revelation. God will not deviate from that. The um, breaker tripped on the... Um, your charger exploded. Yay. Well, praise God. That it's not on fire, is it? It's what? Okay, it's you put. Now. Well, the Holy Spirit just. Come on now. We had a fire in the house. Okay. Well. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I'm back with you. Um, what was that, uh, Prophet John? That that's a good point. So many people talk as if the gifts only work through them. For others, but not for themselves. That is correct. That is correct. When I had cancer and I, um, and I was believing God for healing, I came to a point where I told God that if the word of God doesn't manifest in my life, then kill me now. <laughs> Take me out. Because it should manifest in my life. So if he gave me gifts of the spirit, gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, um, a gift of working of miracles and things like that, then it should be evident in my life. Amen. I remember when I walked into meetings and God will give me a, a word or tell me something or crazy or something like that. It's the gift of knowledge working in my life and in I, I use the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in my marriage all the time. For the men out there, I'm sorry, women, but, but wives are crazy. And I need the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and help me in everything. I'm just saying, praise the Lord. Come on now. Um, I got to flip the breaker. So everything's off, but that's okay. You can go flip it if you want. Do you unplug it? Huh? No, no, no. Just um, find this. Oh, okay. I'll figure it out. So what? So sorry, guys. We just had a little mini fire. And so um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit should work in your life and in my life. I wanted to bring out one more thing. Um, that the Holy Spirit told me. I hope this is helping somebody. Um, the enemy must be really mad to cause a fire next to my bed, my brand new bed. Come on now. Um, I want to bring out one more thing. Judging the prophecy, the prophetic word. First Thessalonians five nineteen verse 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what? To that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. All prophecy is to be judged according to the word of God by the receiver inner witness of the Holy Spirit. 
If I feel like that prophetic word that was spoken over my life does not make sense or does not line up with the word, I I will go and I will search it out and before I even I even say anything. Prophecy does not have to be confirmed of what God is already saying to you, since some do not take the time to listen to God. Sometimes people are running around crazy to this prophet, that prophet, and every other prophet. And they never actually take time to actually hear from God and actually obey the voice of God. But I have that in another chapter. False prophets, for the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. You do not call a person a false prophet. I want you to be, look. Honor, what you honor, you will attract. And if you run around saying everybody's a false prophet, you're actually honoring darkness. You're honoring the falseness. I, I hope you can understand that. You're at, I never call someone a false prophet because he made a mistake with a prophecy. So you do not call a person a false prophet because he made a mistake with a prophecy. If you think they messed it, they missed it. Move on. Cast the words down. Send it back to hell. But don't sit there and be tearing down somebody's ministry because you don't have that knowledge of the word. We must have a grace and a mercy for people who are learning. So many people do not move past the prophetic because of a harsh teacher. teacher. Because so many, there's not, God, and God is working on this in this hour of raising sons and daughters, and raising fathers in this hour, and turning the hearts of the fathers back to the sons. But so many times, I grew up harsh in the prophetic. I, I grew up harsh in the prophetic. And so I was afraid at some point to prophesy that if I missed it. And so remember, we are imperfect vessels with a perfect gift flowing through us. Matthew 7 and 15, 7 verse 15 and 20, your Bible says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a tree, bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruit. Prophetic words. I was told, I love, I love how people, I love comments. I was told if I ever got it wrong that the people would kill me. Praise Daddy God, I was set free from that lie. <laughs> That's Old Testament. Old Testament for sure. Um, Dana, I'm trying to find your... Pro how? I've been praying and fasting for months, reading the word. I've, I'm lost in the fire. My thoughts was the enemy wanted to disrupt you and felt it di directly on me. Okay, um, so that's a, a question not meant for this live stream. If you could do me a favor and Carrie, just comment, say that you're here. Find my wife uh, on Facebook and send her a message and send her that question and um, she'll reply to you. Um, okay. And so if people are sitting there and... Did you? And Carrie did put the edification thing on. Sorry, when I'm reading, I sometimes... the Okay, there it is. Um, not that, babe. Oh, yeah, here it is. I'm going to tag pin that. So there you go for the uh, purpose of prophecy from the mango. Oh, um, okay, wait. Where are we? Okay, wait, go back. Ah, technical difficulties. All right, so um, you'll know them by their fruit. If somebody is prophesying and, and you see their life, 
and the way their life is, are you going to sow into um, bad ground? That's that's like sowing seed. Are you going to connect yourself with bad ground? You will know a false prophet by their fruit. They are not merely someone that has sinned, but someone who is not walking in a relationship with God, neither either not saved or backslidden. Since they, they're not connected to the vine, Jesus, their fruit will be exposed. You will always know a false prophet in the way that they are and by their fruit and how they're prophesying. If um, a false prophet tries to come between, if a false prophet is someone that tries to come between you and God, and so if you need them to hear the voice of God, if you need them to be the voice of God in your life, they're not, they're, they're not, they're, 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 they're false prophet. That's what the Bible says. Not ev- uh, Matthew seven twenty one through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Make many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me who practice lawlessness. Their gifting might be uh, very accurate and powerful, but they could be tapping into other spirits of divination and evil spirits and not of God. So just because somebody's prophesying doesn't mean that they're from God. That's why you must judge every word that is coming in. Thank you, Jesus. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, accountability, people asked about that. Everyone needs a p- accountability. I did mention this earlier, but here's some scripture. It does not matter if you are greater, a greener at the door or the pastor. More importantly, when someone prophesies, there must be accountability because people, people's lives are affected. Moses realized that this, realized this with his encounter with God, but we must realize that when we prophesy, it is God speaking through us and we are accountable ultimately through him. Exodus 4 verse 11 through 12 and Matthew 12 Verse 36 talks about accountability. Um, and I spoke about this. I'm just going to read Matthew 12, verse 36. But I tell you that every careless word that you, that people speak, they shall give account of it on the day of judgment. Think about that. For every careless word that you speak, you're going to have to give account of it. And that's including prophecy. I think. Um, I think gifts do not reveal holiness for the gifts of God of uh, Romans eleven twenty nine. 29 for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. They are earned. They are not earned. They are not merit badges only for certain peer- people. Holiness is a matter of staying connected to Jesus in a relationship. Holiness is a moral decision daily to d- surrender your life and fall deeper in love with the Father. If I love God more than I don't want to break his heart. The gifts do not reveal a person's holiness. However, holiness is necessary for the development and impact of those gifts. Can someone still operate in the gifts while having an active sin in their life? Yes. Remember, we are imperfect vessels with a perfect gift operating through us. Therefore, the gifts are irrevocable and without repentance. I always like to tell the story about when I was a worship leader and I was at church. I don't know who's watching, but I would drink on the weekend and on Sunday morning get up and prophesy and lay hands on people and all that kind of stuff. Yes, I did that at one stage in my life. And the words were accurate, but I was living a sinful life. I repented before I got in the door. And then throughout the week, I lived like I wanted to live. So the gifts of God does not mean you're holy. Just because that's why... 
I, I, I love, I, I, I tell people to get the word for yourself. Um, before I let you go, I only, I'm only going to be in, on here for, um, for about five more minutes. I need to, um, take care of this fire situation that happened. <laughs> And it's one in the morning here in Cape Town. Is there any questions about the prophetic? How do you know if they can get the book? You want to know if you can get the book. I tell you what. If you... I'm, I'm in the process. This is the first chapter of the book. Um, if you... I'm trying to decide. I'll tell you what. If you go ahead and you message me, um, I will send you the PDF version of the book. It's not finished. This is the first chapter. I still need to go into the gifts of the Spirit, the office of a prophet, because you can prophesy, but that doesn't mean that you are a prophet. Um, And that's very important to understand. Because so many people think they prophesy and then now they're a prophet. Um, How do you hear the voice of God? Okay, Uh, I'll answer that question real fast. Hey, uh, Marie. And so if you message me, I will go ahead and I will sing you a copy of this first chapter of the prophetic book. My only thing is, is that if you would please pray and ask God how you can sow seed, uh, if you would like to give a love offering towards it. Um, that's the only thing I'm asking. Um, I'm not going to charge you if you say, you don't even have to send a, a love offering in. I will give it to you free of charge. Um, but please pray and ask how you can so see and um, just message me and I will send you a copy of the book. Uh, com. It's not predicated, but just pray about sowing seed um, when you ask for the book. Um, Okay, um, I'll answer a couple of questions real fast about, um, okay, what is prophecy? Prophecy, this is my personal definition, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The evidence of Jesus, the word of God, being manifested in the earth today. It is divinely inspired, anointed message and a revelatory word from God concerning your life church, local community, and country. That is the prophetic word. Um, uh, Prophet John, it will be in an ebook and in a paperback format. Um, I'm working on getting it done here soon. So um, I should have it done um, in the next couple of months. I do have a book on healing on Amazon right now. Um, It is the evidence, uh, and then um, prophecy is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to speak to those present in an understood language of the hearer. Um, It's like I like to tell people, if you're going to prophesy and you're in an Afrikaans church or in a Spanish-speaking church, make sure you go ahead and you have an interpreter. Don't just bust up in there speaking English and nobody can understand you. If you're using big words, like 13 letter words, then the average person isn't going to understand you. Speak to the audience. Paul said, I became a Jew to the Jew, a Gentile to the Gentile. I became to the P. I, I, but I, yeah, don't get all King James. It is so funny. <laughs> Y'all, it is so funny. When people bust out prophesying in King James, I just, I'm like, I don't, I can't even read King James. I I can. Prophesy to the people until they understand. It creates an atmosphere for Jesus, the word of God, to be manifest in someone's life. When you accept Jesus into your life, you become a walking footprint, a prediction of the word of God. Jesus is the word. Jesus came into your life to live in your life, and now you're a walking footprint of God. You must understand that. 
Baby, can you just in the comments type what I said about um, the book and give our website? Oh, okay. Uh, what is the prophetic? John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me hearing the voice of God. So the prophetic is hearing the voice of God. And if you watch the repeat, I talked about how we develop the voice of God, how I developed the voice of God. I started at seven, six or seven years old and I began to, um, my mom would have me write down, thus says the Lord. And I would write down a couple of things and then I would wait for those things to come to pass. Um, I, the, I, how I hear the voice of God is by through the word of God. And when he speaks to me, it goes hand in hand. It marries itself with the word. God is a personal God who desires intimacy with you. So think about that. My sheep hear my voice. Voice means legacy. Voice means, I mean, think about this. Abraham heard the voice of God and Abraham produced the legacy of God. So prophetic produces the legacy of God on the earth and it all flows through intimacy. Okay. And then, thank you, babe. Let's see. Get it pinned. So oh, you're going to rewrite it. Okay. Um, relationship is communication. If we spend time in prayer, worship, and the word of God, we have a clear path to communication, discerning and understanding the times and the seasons that we are in. It's the prophetic. That goes into the office of the prophet and the Issachar anointing, which I'll, um, Issachar, the Issachar, the Issachar tribe was a people that, that knew and discerned the seasons and the time. When you're in the office of a prophet, you know how to walk in and see the times. Yes, Micah, I would love it. Send me as well. Send in, yes, Cindy, just send me a message so that I, uh, I send it to you. Uh, prophecy does not replace our ability to hear God's voice. Romans 8 and 14. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Prophecy is an added gift to hearing from God ourselves. Because we're in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the prophet was the only voice of God. But today, the Holy Spirit speaks to every believer as well as the prophet. So what does that mean? You don't need me to hear from God. You have the ability. Think about this. John G. Lake, before there was really any study material or anything like that, the revelation that he, he, he gave on healing and things like that, or Alexander Dowie and William Brandon and, and R.W. Schembach and all of them came from a revelation that was from the Holy Spirit. Um, one of the time, one of the things that God worked with me on is that I, I, um, when I began to prophesy and I began to release the gifts of God, I began to, um, I, I would move like I've seen R.W. Shambach do it or Kenneth Hagin do it or them. And one day I get back to my hotel room and God spoke to me and I, I was, I, Smith Wigglesworth was on my mind during the service and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, um, Smith Wigglesworth only had a measure of the Holy Spirit. And I want to give you something far greater. Take the limits off and stop letting me be just the knowledge of John G. Lake, just the knowledge of R.W. Shambach, just the knowledge of Smith Wigglesworth. Take the limits off and watch what I can do in your life and how I can bring an understanding of God to it and release my spirit. Romans 8 and 16, the spirit testifies together with our spirit. The prophet will speak today, but with greater authority and anointing and revelation and is beneficial to your life, church, local community and country. You do have the ability to hear from God, but for some, sometimes God anoints us now, not sometimes, but God anoints a prophet 
because they have the time and the intimacy to release what God's saying. And they've been through the mud and they've been through the mess and they've been rejected and they just don't care any longer. And they're going to release what God says. I just don't care any longer. (laughs) That makes sense. And it testifies with our spirit when the prophetic word is released. So, there's a lot more in this chapter. There's eight, there's eight um, pages and I'm not going to get into all that. But what I really believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at, how long have I been on here? Two hours. Two hours. Lord Jesus, praise the Lord. I'm amazed that I have the data for this. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really amazed that I have the data for this. This must be God. Our MTN hasn't um, figured it out yet. But what I'm saying is, is that to be a prophet... With all that that I've said in the last two hours, for me, it's such a weighty thing, and I just want God. I don't, I don't care about the title of a prophet, uh, the title of apostle. Um, it doesn't matter to me. I've been ordained in those things, and I have the nice paper to prove it. But it doesn't matter to me. Did it, did it do something? The ordination did do something. I can honestly say when I was ordained as a prophet and an apostle, um, something, something happened, um, an approval happened. Um, and I knew that I knew that I, I can't explain it. I knew that I knew then it, it helped, but I just want God. And if you stay with that and you do it out of love and you allow God to bring you leaders that will teach you and guide you and will pull upon your heart out, pull, pull upon your heart and pull out the things of God in your life, you'll see worlds change. You'll see nations. You'll, 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 you'll see how things change. Prophecy started with me in a little church service of about five or six people. And I had, he, it started with the gift of prophecy of speaking in tongues. And I remember I, I screamed out in my prayer language and someone um, interpreted. And then I was like, wow. And I couldn't wait. And in the week later, I prophesied to um, someone in one of my parents' services. Um, Mike, I send healing to your life in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And then it just began to build confidence. It began to build a thing in my life. Um, and then one more thing. Because when you begin to honor the prophetic and when you begin to actually begin to move into the things of God, this thing can overtake you, especially if you're called to the office of a prophet. I, I, I came also to a place in my life where I um, neglected or I just ignored the things of God. I would get a vision. I was like, oh, that's a vision. Wow. I would get a dream. Wow, that's another dream. I would get a prophetic word. And I lost my wonder. Never lose your wonder for the prophetic. Never lose your wanting God to use you. Always, when you give a prophetic word, when you preach, when you prophesy, when you pray in tongues, and when you are praying in your prayer language, whatever, when you're singing, when you're worshiping, never lose the wonder for it. Wow, I was able to praise God. I was able to release that. I never, it, I, I don't, and I, I, I was there. I, I came to a place where I let apathy come into the gifts of God and all that kind of things. And I don't do that anymore. I, I cherish 
because I realized that there's 7.9 billion people in this world. And I'm just one. And God used me the other day to prophesy over Vietnam. God used me to pray um, a blessing. God used me to grow out someone's lead. God, I never, I never lose that wonder because God can use someone else. And the call is so important. And it will cost you everything. The call of God will cost you everything. And what got me to where I'm at today and why I protect the integrity upon my life and the ministry and all that is I realize how important it is that God, A, called me, but then chose me. I don't do certain things. I don't go certain ways. I, um, I don't answer certain questions. Um, because I know the weight. I've, I've gone through it. I'm still going through. But then I, I get to... Um, I get to see my son being born, which was a prophetic word. I get to um, see people's lives changed and to know that God chose me for such a time as this causes me just to surrender more Um, because I just want God. I could be in Cape Town, South Africa today, and if he tells me tomorrow to wake up and go to China or Asia or Australia or back to the States, no matter what it looks like, I'll go. Because I... Being a prophet or someone that flows in the prophetic or with the gifts of the Spirit, I get a front row seat. You get a front row seat to see the miraculous of God every single day. Did you catch that? You have a front row seat. If you stay in the secret place, if you stay in hiding, if you stay in a place of surrender unto God to see the miraculous anytime, anywhere, any moment. And that that blows my mind. Does it fuel me? No. Does it help me keep my wonder? Yes. But my love and me just wanting God surpasses all that. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you. Lord God, you're going to begin to awaken the prophetic. That Lord God, you're going to begin to cause a hunger and a desire for them to know you. That Lord God, that they'll speak with accuracy. That they'll see that they are walking prediction of you. That Lord God, they will know you just like Jesus knows you. Lord God, let them come to a place where they just want God more. Not the crowds, not the next prophetic word, not the front row seat to miracles, but at the end of the day, at the core of who they are, let them cry out, God, I just want you. And out of that relationship, 
Out of that intimacy, let the prophetic flow. Let the words, let the healing, let the knowledge, all the gifts of the Spirit begin to flow out of them, out of that relationship of just wanting you, God. Father God, I thank you that the people that are listening, they are world changers, they are history makers, that Father God, you're bringing them into the nations, that you're calling nations to them, that Lord God, that you have called them for such a time as this. And Lord God, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord God, for being a Jehovah Jireh. Provide for them, watch over them. But Father God, I ask that right now, as the presence of God falls in their house, in their car, at their workplace, wherever they're at, that they get what they need from you, Father God. Healing, let it manifest. Miracles, let it manifest. Organs that are not there, let it let it, let it manifest. Let back conditions, let deaf ears, let eyes open up. The person in the wheelchair get out. Let healing and signs and wonders take place, Father God. Father God, I thank you, Father God, that for the prophet out there that's faced rejection, that they're not certain of their calling and their purpose, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, that you, Lord God, are sharpening in their discernment, sharpening Holy Spirit training, guide them and lead them, put them in a place of love, Lord God. Put them in a place of love for their gifts to be developed. Let the moving of the Spirit of God begin to come back into the churches, Lord. Let the prophetic and the apostolic begin to come back. Let the wells begin to rise up. Let them begin to flow again. Let rivers of waters begin to flow out of their lives. And I thank you, Father God, that they will love you more and just want you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, family. Um, thank you, Jesus. Okay, fam, so I am going to let you go. I've been on here for over two hours. Wow, that's a miracle. It was only supposed to be a maybe a four-minute video. Um, okay, so if you want the first chapter of the book, if you want the first chapter of the book, um, send me a message and I will send you the PDF version of it. Um, I am asking that you would give a, a love offering um, if you would like that. God bless you, pa Prophet John. Uh, please message me if you would, I would love to connect with you, um, sir. Um, yeah, let me know that if you want the book. Oh, wow. What an honor, Lena, to have you on. I hope I said your name on, to have you on. Um, and if you want the first chapter of the book, please go ahead and message me and I will send it to you. The only thing I'm asking is if you would consider sowing seed and you can go to www.micahandcarry.com. Uh, Miranda, wow, what an honor, an honor to have the first time people watching on, um, what a privilege. Um, and then the second thing that I was going to say, um, it must not matter. So, all right, guys, I, um, man, that was something important. Anyway, I love you guys. Bless you. May God keep you, cause your face to shine upon you. And be blessed. And we'll see you Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday. Um, we'll have Kingdom Conversations. All right. Love you guys. Bless you. Bye-bye.